share this morning was a message that has been brewing the last couple weeks, last couple months. And the title of the message is on communion, the heart of the Father. What is the heart of the Father is communion. And uh, I would like to read out John 17, verse 1 to 5. And I know a lot of people have taken this message here and have made it about each other. And it is about each other. But ultimately this message in John 17 is about us being one with Jesus and Jesus being one with God. And us three being one with each other. I want to read here in John 17, 1 to 5. These words spoke Jesus and lifting up his eyes to heaven said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him glory over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me, Jesus is saying, glorify me, with own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is asking God that he would glorify him, with the same glory that he had before the world was. And then if we flip back into John 17, 20 to 26, he starts praying that God and Jesus would glorify us with him. Those three of us would be together with, as, as one with him. John 17, verse 26, Neither pray I for thee alone. Now he's praying for you, he's praying for me. He's praying for, for us individually here. Also corporately, but I think mostly individually. I don't pray for thee alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that also that they also may, may be one in us. That the world may be lo- that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, Jesus is saying that you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they that that you could be that we could be one with him, and that individually, I, Aaron, could be one with Jesus and we'd be one with God. Jesse, you could be one with Jesus and one with God. I believe it's what this verse 27 is saying. He's saying us three would be one with each other. And ultimately, if we're all one with Jesus, we're going to become one with each other. Because Christ and that ultimate connection. And the glory which thou gavest me have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, and they may be perfect in one. That the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, will it they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them my name, thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Here Jesus is asking, he wants to have communion with us. Individually, yeah, I'm also corporately, I'm, that, will come, that will come as a byproduct of our communion with Jesus and with God. Our time together with Him. So when I talk about, there's different levels of communion. There's communion with God, there's communion with others, there's communion with yourself. You know, are you even okay with who God made you? Are you okay to be the person God has called you to be? But ultimately what I wanted to talk about today is, is different levels of communion. The first one I want to talk about is... Communion with God through death. There's something about death and blood that Jesus desires. And there's something about He desires you for you and for me. When I'm talking about you, I'm talking about me too. But that we would be a self-sacrifice. That we would be willing to be laid on the altar. Just like Abraham told God, he was going to lay him on the altar. God wants to lay, He wants us to be laid on the altar, willing to die for Him. Because it is only through death that a life becomes useful to God. As long as we have our own agendas, our own ways, our own, it's only through death. And that's why the death of Jesus was so powerful, because His life became useful to God when, when, when He went to the cross like that. And it's the same way with us. And when you read through the, through the Bible, there was time through the Old Testament and the New Testament... And there was always a death. There was Abel was supposed to bring an offering to God, and there was that blood and that death that brought that brought something to God that that was a sweet smell to Him. 
And then it was uh, then when, when they came out of the ark, it was again, it was, it was Noah was doing a burnt offering unto God. There was something about blood and death that Jesus wants. I mean, God wants. And so all through the Old Testament, you saw it, even coming up to the Passover, where there was a time when, when they were supposed to kill this Passover lamb. It was a representation of Jesus, but it was blood. It was death. It was something had to give his life for something else to live. And here, if they would not put that blood around this doorpost, somebody in this house would die. Something that God was asking for was that that, that, that blood would be, would be poured out. And when you think about it, that, that morning, that night, that was the, the anticipation, the, the excitement in, in the house of, of knowing that this death angel was going to pass through. And, and here were children, you know, everybody was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. And anticipation was high that we had to be ready to move. At 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody was up, had their shoes tied, had their, their clothes in their hand, and they were ready to go. Can you imagine if God would ask you for your whole family to be up at that time in the morning? And the night before, you know, the children were watching their, their father slaying this, this animal thing. And they knew that if this blood was not across his doorpost correctly, somebody in that house is going to die. The oldest person in that house will die if that blood is not applied correctly to the doorpost. The oldest son. The oldest son, yeah. Can you imagine, you know, as you're sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning, knowing that this is going to go over just soon. And else the death angel is going to pass over you. Or your brother's going to die. Or your son right beside you is going to die just like that. That's how significant and that's how intense this moment was. They did not know what was going to happen. Can you put yourself back in that time? But there was a self-sacrifice. There was something that needed to happen. Without blood, a mortal man cannot access a holy God. Without the blood of Jesus, without blood, sacrificial blood always meant the offering of a life. It always meant the offering of life, and it still does. There's something that, it, that, has to, that we have to be poured out, that we have to come to the end of ourselves and to lay ourselves on the altar and for, for that life to come forth. You know, Jesus did not spare the sacrifice of our life. Jesus, Jesus did not spare us so that we can spare the sacrifice of our life. Jesus sacrificed his life to make it possible and desirable to sacrifice ours. If Jesus wouldn't have done that, it would there have been no reason for us to give our life because it would there, it would have been foolishness. But Jesus made it made it possible and desirable through the blood that we could do that. And when we understand what the blood does, the blood is so much. There, I mean, you can spend days and days and days talking about the blood, and you cannot extinguish it. Everything goes back to the blood, the blood and the wine, the the broken body. Everything goes back to that blood. So what are the privileges of being under the blood? I would like to read a little bit Hebrews 9, verse 1 to 3. You know, if you're reading, if you're reading Hebrews 9, verse 1 to 3, it says, Then merely the first covenant also had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, the table bread and the sure bread, which is called the sanctuary. And the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So 1 to 3 we read there, then we also read from verse uh, 6 to 8. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the servants of God, the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing. So when you read that, you know, the blood gave us the right to dwell in the presence of God. Usually back then, only the high priest could go in there. Only the high priest was allowed to, to, to enter into that place. Here, the way was made... That everyone has a right to dwell in the presence of God. Everyone has a privilege of, of offering spiritual sacrifices to God. Individually, we can come and we can offer a spiritual sacrifice to God. Before that, they couldn't. They always had to go to the high priest and wait till a certain time, till a certain blood was shed, till they could actually do that. Actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The first was the sanctuary the holy place and the holy of holies. That's what the Hebrews 9 was talking about. But then in Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22 is, is where um, 
he talks about uh, Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22. He talks about how there was a, a way made. Hebrews 10, verse 9. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood, by a new living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And here we were able to come in by a new living way. We could become a high priest in the house of God with our bodies washed. With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's what... That's why this, this blood is so powerful. Because it gives us the right to dwell in the presence of God. It gives us the privilege to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Where only the high priest could use to do it. Now we have that opportunity. We have the power to acquire blessing for others. Usually the high priest came in and he was just the one that would, would come and release blessing. Now we have that same authority to go and release blessing wherever we go. Through that blood that was shed once and for all. Through Jesus Christ. You know, under the Old Testament, everything was physical. But in the New Testament, everything is spiritual. We, you know, there, there's, a, there's a new level of anointing. There's a new level of authority. There's a new level of blessing that we can get in the, in the New Testament because of what Christ did. And it all starts with the heart. You know, the heart is the center of a human. And the conscience is in the center of the heart. And that's where God wants to live. He wants to live in our hearts. He wants to live in our conscience. He wants to, he wants, you know, out of the heart comes, all the blood that pumps through you comes out of your heart. And all that is just a representation of Christ. Communion with the Father through self-sacrifice. So what is the blessing in drinking the blood? Why do we drink the blood? What is the point in, in drinking the blood? What is this blessing? How is this blessing worked out in us? And what should our attitude be about drinking the blood? And there are three different parts I want to bring out. What is the blessing? Is it is there's victory. There's victory once and for all. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was finished, and there was a victory done once and for all. And that is the privilege that we have by the blessing in drinking the blood. We can have that victory. And the second one is how is this blessing worked out in us? It's ongoing. It is still victory, but it is ongoing. It is a victory that we, we can continue to walk in through this self-sacrifice blood that was shed on the cross, through this Passover lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world for our sins. And so what should our attitude be toward drinking the blood? It should be victory. But it's not just victory for us. It's victory that we share. It's victory that we help others achieve. It's victory because it's not just about us. It's about he died for all mankind, and we don't want to just go our own way and just be about us. It's about everyone. This victory is for everyone. And that's what makes that blood so powerful. It's not just a thing where just one high priest or one person goes in. It's victory for everyone. The blood grants us a right to, to, to a place in heaven. We can sit in the heavenly realm with him. The blood makes us fit for the pleasures of heaven. It gives us songs of heaven. It, there's something about that blood that, that lights up our spirit. It makes us come alive when we think about it. There's, there, there's so much when you start reading about the blood, it's just, it's just like, wow, Lord, is it really that powerful? And yes, it is. And then he goes and leaves us a symbol of the blood because of what he wants. Shouldn't the thought of holiness for all of us release a greater understanding of him and cause us to want us to go deeper? The holiness of God. Shouldn't that thought want to make us go deeper? Because only the heart that is fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit will surely find out what reconciliation and communion with the Father means. We have to be fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Lay on the altar for Him if we want to really know what this blood means. And this blood is ongoing. The more we die, the more we live. The more you surrender your life to Christ, the more comes out of you. It's nothing that can, nobody else can stop you from. It's your life between you and the Father. How much are you willing to forgive? How much are you willing to, 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 to change? I mean, how much am I willing? How much are all of us willing? 
Another thing that was amazing about the reading about it is both the wrath of God that punishes sin and the love of God that redeemed the sinner spring from the same source. So to us, it's unbelievable. It's Isaiah 43, chapter 43 to 45. It talks about how the love of God comes forth and how the wrath of God. You know, to us, it's like with one or the other. It's like the love of God or it's the wrath of God. But it's really both of it come from that same source. There's something that God wants, and if He doesn't want it, it there's judgment comes. But there's also that same source comes the love of God that is that is, that is inviting people in, that is that is in, drawing people into His love. And, and there again, it, it's com- uncomprehendable. There's parts of it that we can comprehend, but it continues to grow as, as we as we seek Him. The next part I wanted to bring out in our communion with God and, and Jesus is through prayer. There's something that happens where prayer is an effort and is an act of the will. There's something about praying that you can say, well, I don't feel like praying. But there's something when you decide to go spend time with the Lord that something happens. And it is an act of the will. It is choosing. There's so much when I start realizing there's so, so much about choosing before we feel it. Choosing to do something because it's the right thing. Choosing to do this and then God starts releasing his part of it. And, and here was what happened in, in, in Acts. In Acts 1, they were talking about the partnership in prayer. The whole church came together. And out of this partnership with prayer of choosing to do the will of God, the church was birthed. And Acts 2, you know, there came out of Acts 1. And that was Pentecost. And there again, it was through prayer. It was through believers coming together to pray. And Acts 3 was sustaining the move of God. And that was also through prayer. And it was in the moment, in the moment when they were going into prayer, that they met John, Peter and John were going up into in the, in the prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Don't you think they could have been working? Yeah, and I was coming over that time to pray, but they made an act of the will to go into prayer. And it was in the, going into the prayer that they met this man that was laying there. And he's like, hey, give me some money. I got to give me some money. And he said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It was in prayer that those things came forth. What would have happened if they would not have done that? What would have happened if they would not have, if they would have been too busy to pray? They would, they would have missed the God moments right around them. And, and so there's something about the communion with God that we have to spend time in prayer, individually, corporately, together. You know, you can read that in Acts. That's what created it. You know, coming into your calling means coming out of our comfort zones. We have to, to, to be able to just say, Lord, this is what I want to see happen. And come out of where we, sometimes we're just too comfortable. We just want to do our own thing and and we don't want to just lay that stuff on the line. There was one saying I read says, It is not so true that, that prayer changes things as that prayer changes me. And I change things. And part of it is true, you know, God changes it. But there's something about it when people rise up and, and go into prayer that they make the difference. What? You know, God, yeah, God was the one making the difference. But it was through people that were in prayer. Through people in prayer is why Peter and John were able to walk up there and, and see this guy healed. Because they were walking in between with the Father, and the Father was releasing his life through people. We make a living by what we get, but we get a life by what we give. And so here Peter and John kept their appointment in prayer. Here they walked up, and they, they saw this man laying there. And they went up, and he was able to walk. Because of their, of their commitment to God. And what I wanted to bring out here is there was a key. There was a key that happened because of their communion with the Lord. Their communion with Jesus through prayer. There was a key that happened. And there's keys in our lives. If, we're actually, if we keep walking with the Lord, we're going to keep seeing keys come up. Here was the key. You know, when you look through the Old Testament, the New Testament, it seemed every move of God, there was a, a key that happened. There's something that shifted right in the moment. You know, when, when, uh, when the walls of Jericho needed to come down, what did God do? He sent Joshua and Caleb in. 
and they found the key. It was through Rahab, but she, she hit them, and she, she told them some of the things that encouraged them. She said, you know, we're all shaking. She said, ever since you guys came out of Egypt, she said, we're all over here quaking. And still all those people had died in the wilderness, and still the enemy over here was shaking. How does that make sense? There was already a key, but what it did is it, it boosted Josh and Caleb's confidence that we could do this. I believe they realized that God was in it ever since way back there, and they're going to go and keep walking, and there was a key there. There was a key in uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 11 and 12, when David's group of men, they got robbed. And they were, they were going after, the enemy came and took all their wives and children and everything about them. And they were crying out, they were thinking of stoning David. And in the midst of it, he was crying out to the Lord what he should do. And they found this Egyptian laying there that the enemy had left for dead. The enemy had left this guy laying there for dead. And they, they gave him nourishment. They, he hadn't eaten, I read it last night, he hadn't eaten for three days and three nights. He was sick and they, let, they brought him back to life. And he gave him nourishment, and they told him, and they asked him, where did our people go? And this man said, if you will not kill me, and you will make sure you don't give me back to my former masters, I will take you to them. And he did. Here David, here, they, here David went and nourished this man back to life, and he took him to the enemy camp, and they were in the middle of eating and drinking and celebrating the, the, what they had done to Judah. And David and his men, there was, I think, 400 men. There were 200 that didn't go along because they were too weak and they didn't feel like going. And David and his 400 men went in and took, completely destroyed the whole thing and took their own wives and children and possessions all back again. What would have happened if he would not have recognized the key that was right around him? It might have looked like he was just a dead little person laying beside the road. He's of no value. What are we doing as we see people? Are we able to see the keys that are right around us? You know, and it was that way with Jesus and the woman at the well. In John 4, 17, he was, he was walking up and, and he met this woman at the well and he's sitting there and this woman comes down and, and he said, you got seven husbands, one you got isn't your husband. And she's like, whoa, this guy knows me. But he unlocked the key. And she went back into the city and she told the people, come, come and see this man that told me everything about us. And he said, the next time he went, the whole city came to meet him. One key. Another key was when Jesus came to the man in the tombs, Luke 8, 38 to 40. Jesus came to this person, and he set him free. And this man fell down on his knees, his feet, and he wanted to go with him. And Jesus said, no. He said, go back and tell the good things that, you, that have been done to you. And he went back. First, there was, one chapter said they wanted to get rid of him, but later when he went back, so again, the whole town came to meet him. It was a key. What for keys are around us in this county, in our lives, and the people around us? What are we, what are we seeing? What is God doing? When Paul came to Lystra, Acts 14, 8, there was a, there was a cripple there that had never walked. He was 40 years old. And he went up and he prayed him and he called him back to life. And revival happened. Philippi, I think it was. It was, revival happened. There again, it was a key for revival. It was, it was that communion with Jesus, that communion with God, the, the heart of the Father that, that was able to see that. And it was the same way later in a few chapters later, it was, he was in, I think it was Ephesus where, or was it Philippi, where that woman with the divination came and she started proclaiming things about, about him, about Paul. And it was the right thing. It wasn't a lie. It was the truth. But after many days, he said he followed him. And after a while, Paul rebuked his spirit. And it came out of her. And there was revival. They threw all their, they burned their, their, their folks and all kinds of stuff. So I want to just encourage you to, to keep looking for that key. The third thing I wanted to bring out in our communion with God is through His Word. There's something about our communion with God that His Word is life. His Word makes it come alive. It makes the Bible come alive. It makes our life come alive. What is the Word of God doing in your life? What is the Word of God doing in my life? I was reminded as I was praying on about John 8, 32. It says, And you shall know the truth, which is Jesus, it's God, and the truth shall set you free. Now the question, what if we don't know the truth? Will the truth set us free? No, it won't. 
If you don't know the Word of God and you don't know the truth, it will not set you free. And that's why the Word of God is so powerful. Because it sets us free. In Deuteronomy 8, 3, Jesus was tempted. Now, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in Deuteronomy 8, 3, uh, Jesus was tempted by the devil and he used Deuteronomy 8, 3 to destroy the works of darkness. Here Jesus, he said, Deuteronomy 8, 3 talks about man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It was Jesus using an Old Testament scripture to defeat the devil in every area. But he knew the word of God. You know those people that, those, those apostles and prophets and, and uh, disciples, they knew the word of God. They used the Old Testament scripture and the word of God to defeat the enemy. That's what they had. My question is, do we know the word of God? Three times Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy and the devil was defeated. One book of the Old Testament, which some people say we don't even need anymore, defeated the enemy. If one book of the Old Testament didn't need to defeat the enemy, and we have the New Testament, which is supposed to be so much better, why is anybody walking in defeat? It's because they don't know the truth. And that's why the truth isn't setting them free. You know, our body needs feeds on physical food. Our soul feeds on whatever stimulates our mind and emotions. And your spirit feeds on your communion with God. So what are we communing with? Or through the work day, through the work week, as we, as we go about our way to work, as we do whatever, what are we communing with? Are we communing with the Word of God? Because that's what's going to set us free. You know, when our soul and our spirit both come alive, they light each other up. The spirit can make the soul alive by reading the Word. Your mind, will, and emotions become alive when you read the Word. And that's what we need. We need to... We need to have this communion with God, we need to be in communion with His Word. We need to know what the Word of God says. So my question is, if the key to revival is hunger, somebody, I heard it a few different ways, that the key to revival is hunger. So my question is, how hungry are you? How hungry am I? You know, there's times in my life when I experience a whole lot of things of God, and it seems like sometimes it, it sort of like, Maybe not as much anymore. But is it really just because of our level of hunger how much we experience of God? And I believe it is. I really believe we, we only feed about how much out of how much hunger we have. Because if you go to the store and you're and you're hungry, I can pretty much guarantee you, if you're like me, you're gonna buy a whole lot more things than if you go and you're not hungry. You walk in the store and you're not hungry. You just ate a big meal. Like, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. If you go in the store and you're hungry, like, I want that. I want that. I want that. Why did you buy it? I don't know. I was hungry. You know, I was going to eat. But I think it's the same way in the spirit. If there's something inside of you that is extremely hungry, you're going to be filled. You're going to get something else. So I just want to encourage us to, to stay hungry for the Lord. So I also want to read out of Romans 8, 16 and 17, which refers to the word. I turn to Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Once we become aware of the Word of God, once we know the Word of God, the Spirit that bears witness with our spirit, it bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Once we understand that, once we understand the dynamic of his word, we know that we are joint heirs with God. And the enemy can't shake us up in every little lie that he throws at us. Because we know it's not the truth. We know what the word of God says. And the truth sets us free. Another scripture verse here is John, 1 John. 1 John 5, 6 to 12. It's the more truth. 
That is he that came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ. There again, it talks about the blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, and the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive this witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God that he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son has a witness in himself. So here again, we can read about the three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We need the Word in us. So that when the, so that when the lies come, we, can, we, we, we have it ingrained in us. You know, this week in a, in a Bible study, I was... We were talking about the power of the Word and the power of, of understanding who we are in Christ. And this one man mentioned to me, he wanted me to bring some more of our Who I Am in Christ books along. And he mentioned to me that usually, he said, people say that everybody struggles with lust. And he said everybody maybe does a different level. He said he might have been like a three or a four. But he said, after he started after he started declaring every day who he was in Christ, he said his levels of thoughts and lust and stuff came from, probably from a four down to a half. And I had to think about, is that actually what it is? Because I know years ago I had struggled with some of those things. But lately I can say I don't own it all. And I sometimes wonder, is that really true that I... I mean, when people talk about, like, is it really that serious that people talk about? And all of a sudden, on Thursday night, when he mentioned that, I was like, that's what it is. We understand our position in Christ. We understand what the Word of God says. We don't understand how it happens. But it destroys lust. It destroys those lies that are in there without us even knowing it. It's because the Word of God becomes alive in our spirit. It, it pushes out those fleshly things. So I have a question. If you're struggling with things... Do you understand the Word of God? Are you reading the Word of God? Is it becoming alive in you? Are you devouring it? Is it? Or do you believe, oh, this is just how every human being is always going to be. We're just always going to struggle with our life. It's just who we're made to be, which is a struggle. No, I tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. I know it personally. I know it from just the, the, the declaration this last week that you can live free from that. In Christ, through the Word of God, you can live free from it. Amen. Another situation that to uh, to uh, get free from it, I believe the biggest key is in 1 Corinthians 14, in praying in tongues. I believe there's something, when we're able to release our tongue to God, that does something that is beyond, supersedes our imagination. And He starts cleansing us. He knows what's in us. But we don't even know it. The last thing a person wants to do is give their tongue to God. Because they can control what they say and what they do. But when you release that to God and you say, Lord, just cleanse me. And you just start praying to him and you start, and he starts washing you from whatever factor that you never even knew about. He, he just, I think that's another, another powerful weapon that we have. I also want to read in Psalms 1. It talks about how we can, you know, if we're, Psalms 1, chapter 1. It talks about how we can walk in that blessing. He says, bless. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, on the word of God, on Jesus, he meditates day and night. This person is going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring for his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ten and the ungodly are not so, they're like the chaff that flows with, that, that gets blown away. But the worst I wanted to bring out is his delight is in the word of God. It's in the law of the Lord, and on his law does he meditate day and night. That's what God wants from us. He wants us just to spend that time with him. 
And then we're just laying there, just turn on the Bible, just listen to the Bible, just let the Bible mold through you, just, just meditate, just like a, a cow out in the pasture, just chewing on her cud, just continue to let the Word of God flow through you. And when those lies come up, you say, no, that's not who I am. That, that was the old person. You can get behind me, Satan. But we have to meditate on that Word. Because it was, it's what sets us free. Communion with the heart of the Father. It's through His Word. God, Jesus, the Word, they're one. It's also the message that Jesus preached. In Luke 24, 47, He talked about repentance and remission of sins. There's repentance and remissions of sin. That's what He wants. And when you, when you read uh, what, what re repentance and remission of sins meant, remission meant freedom. It meant forgiveness. It meant taking away. Uh, another word is liberty. Deliverance. It was like taking an eraser and wiping off the whole board. That's what God's Word does. In Him, through repentance, it takes away those old thoughts. It takes away those lies. It takes away those, those things that have, that have tormented us. Remission, it, it removes them. And that's what Christ has for us. Through His Word, as we understand His Word. You can't rightly divide the Word of God so you let it rightly divide you. The only way you will rightly divide the Word of God is if you let it rightly divide you. And then the next part I wanted to bring out is communion with God and Jesus. The next thing that usually happens is it brings pain. All through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, if you let the Word of God if you lay yourself on the altar, it will bring pain. You can say, we want these keys, we want this, we want that. But there's something about the pain. What does it bring out? Does it, does it produce thankfulness? You know, when you read about the disciples, they saw this beautiful miracle, and they started preaching the Word of God. 5,000 people came to Christ, and they were excited. Next thing they knew, they were called before the, the chief priest, and they were flogged, they were whipped. They were saying, you're not going to speak this name any, this way anymore. And they went back, and they were rejoicing that they were able to suffer for the name of Jesus. You know, Paul and Silas, they were in prison. And they were whipped, and they were scourged because of, of, the, of the, the life that brought out, brought out of that one city when there was revival happening. They were in the innermost stop. When I was over in Switzerland, I think it was one time, we, were able, we, were, we went into one of those stops like they used to use. And that thing was designed to make you as uncomfortable as it could. There was no way you were going to rest that night. The way they, they pulled your legs out, the way they, 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 they put their hands, everywhere it was in that stop was uncomfortable. And it was made so that you can't relax. And that's when they were in that innermost parts of the prison. Were they there feeling sorry for themselves? I'm sure they weren't. In the midst of that pain, they were they were giving their they were, they were offering sacrifices. They were worshiping the Lord. How could they worship the Lord at midnight after they were flogged and whipped and thrown into innermost parts of the prison and unrightfully used? How could they do that? It was because of their communion with the Father. It was their heart of the love that they had for the Father. They were able to go into that pain and they didn't even feel the pain. I don't believe yeah, they might have felt it to a certain extent. But that love of the Father, that communion they had with Jesus just took them right through it. And so I want to prepare your mind. If you really want all that God has for your life, are you willing to go through the pain? Paul was shipwrecked. What? How many times? Seven times, I think it said. Or was it three times? I don't know. Three times, but I think maybe he was beaten seven times. But he was, he was like, he had so much turmoil and so much challenges. But every time, what would he do? He'd get up again and he'd shake himself off and he would keep on going. One time they left him for dead. And after a while, he'd shake himself up and off he'd go again to the next town. How often can we just embrace that pain and just walk through it? And so the question is, does pain produce thankfulness? You know, there was a time when I could hardly stand be because of that one nerve and my pulled hamstring. And pain shot through my whole body from the bottom of my foot up to my head. To the point I almost passed out at the chiropractor when he was working at. I had to go outside. But you know what? Every time when I got about out of bed in the morning, do you know what I think about when I put my foot down on the floor? Thank you, Lord. It doesn't hurt. But, you know, but it took that pain to produce the thankfulness. There's something about that, that pain that we can walk through it and we can look to God and we can stay thankful or we can just become angry at God. 
And it's a hard choice. There was a slogan the Marines used. They said, if you want to make, if you want the most people in your life, make it easy. If you want the best, make it hard. Their slogan in the Marines is, if you want to make, if you want the most people, make it easy. If you want the best, make it hard. And I think sometimes God presses people to see who's actually going to press through. Who's actually going to, who's actually going to walk through the, the challenges that come because he wants the best. He doesn't want, you know, there's many called, but there are few chosen. And I believe that choosing comes to us. Will we continue to be laid down as a sacrifice to the Lord? Will you, we continue to, to, to let Him mold us and shape us and, and, and that pain of just, just to be able to just lay ourselves down? It's a continued process. And sometimes I wonder, you know, sometimes God allows things to happen to shake things up as well. You know, there was a time when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and people say, well, it was Moses wasn't ready to lead them. Therefore, that's why it took so long. But I also believe there was another element that maybe was more dynamic because the people didn't want to leave. And it was that shaking up that God allowed to happen, that pain of the flogging of Egypt to, to actually get them ready to get out of where they were at. And I think it's the same way in our day and age. There's something with COVID-19. There's something that, sh with vaccination, there's something that's shaking the whole human race and it's making their hearts turn to God in a way that, oh, I'm not just going to sit here at my farm the next 50 years. Now people are saying, I don't know what's going to happen by next year. You know, all of a sudden they're putting their trust in, they're, they're looking to God, even ourselves. How much more trust do we have to put in God now than we did five years ago? There's thoughts toward, why well, is it going to happen out of this? And we have to choose to say, you know what, Lord? You're going to protect us. We're going to stay in communion with you, with your heart, and you're going to take us through. And he will. He will continue to be faithful. You know, the disciples, they came back rejoicing when they were beaten for Lord Jesus. They were rejoicing that they were able to suffer for the name of Jesus. And how many of those like, man, this is right what people did to us. And, but do we actually understand the pain that, that people went through for the name of Jesus? And are we willing? Are we willing to left to enter into that level? Luke 6, 23, Jesus talks about that they will persecute you. They persecuted me, and they will persecute you. And it's what did he say that we should do when it happens? Rejoice. He said, rejoice. Leap for joy. Be exceedingly glad. Be exceedingly glad. Oh, we'll leap for joy. Everybody get up. Let's leap for joy. Are we being persecuted? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, yeah. Oh. Let's start thinking about, start thinking about what's going to happen when you get persecuted. Think about how you're going to handle it. You're going to leap for joy. You're going to doubt that the Lord is going to help you through it. But we have to keep, we have to program our mind to think that direction before it happens. So when it comes, it's not like, well, I was looking for that. I mean, the God is unfaithful. No, we're going to program our mind. I'm not saying we're going to get persecuted like that. But the point I want to bring out is we're going to continue to walk in a position of leaping for joy and a rejoicing in every day, our communion with the Lord. The last part I wanted to bring up was communion with God. And Jesus brings joy. I didn't even bring it, I didn't even put it together till this morning, all of a sudden you guys were talking about the fourth cup is joy. And I was like, well yeah, that is the fourth cup. I didn't, when I was, I was just talking about the joy that comes out of our life. When we, the, do we love telling others what God did for us? Think about the, the first time you had a date with somebody you loved or you, and there was so much joy coming out of you, you couldn't wait to tell other people about it. Gonna wait to tell you. you were, your your whole mind was consumed about this person to the point you probably couldn't eat or drink and stuff. Is our joy with Jesus that much? Does, does our heart overflow with our in our communion with Him that we that we have so much joy telling other people about Him? You now they usually say when you they usually say when you're when you're selling a farm that there's three things that matter. Location, location, location. 
And you know, it's the same way in the spirit. What do the things, three things matter? Location, location, location. And when we look at that, when we see people around us, do we actually see them the way God sees them? Are we able to prophetically look at a person and do we see all the, the problems and all the issues or actually we see them with the heart of the Father? You know, we all want this Joseph anointing and this David anointing, and, but every one of them went through tremendous pain. Tremendous pain, but what was Joseph's? He had the prophetic insight to see into the future. And he always remember what God promised back here. And there's something about when you're going through that pain that you have to remember the promise of what God is calling you to do. And you're going to say, I'm going to be faithful to the end. I'm going to press in. In the midst of every challenge, I'm going to keep doing what God is calling you to do. And when you hang on to that vision, that dream, it will become a reality. Because I believe there's a time as we continue to grow in the Lord that, there, that when we die, we want to die empty. Like I heard this, this, this week where the guy was saying what he believes when he comes to heaven, the first thing he's going to meet, he wonders if the first thing he meets isn't going to be his spirit man. And he wants that spirit man to be empty. That whatever our spirit up there is telling us to do, whatever we agreed to do, we would work it out that when we come up to heaven that everything that we were called to do would be done. And I believe it's the same way with Jesus. You know, he died at 33. He died empty. He died, fulfilled what he was called to do. And I want to just encourage all of us that we would walk in that way, that we would, when we end, end, end our life, we would be fi finished what God called us to do. You know, the whole purpose of the cross is to become like Jesus. The whole purpose of the cross, the whole purpose of the blood is to become like Jesus, to lay our life on the altar. But you know, so many of us, we have been homeschooled into a lie. We have been homeschooled in the wrong home. We have been homeschooled with lies of the enemy instead of what does the Word of God say. And we have to come back to the, to the school of Christ. What does God's Word say? What does, the, what, you know, what does He want from our lives? So my question to you, to me... Is everything God gives us is made to, to change you or be multiplied? Everything we get gets changed or multiplied. What are we going to multiply? Are we going to multiply fear? Or are we going to multiply faith? Are we going to continue to walk in the midst of every challenge with a focus on Christ? Or are we going to continue to pull back and say, you want this journey is too hard? This journey is not. No, we need to press toward the mark of the high calling of Christ. Do we shine in the midst of trials? Do you shine in the midst of pain when things go wrong? Does the glory of God come out of you? Or what, what comes out of us? And today I believe it's just, we just need to continually bask in His presence. And just, just know that we are a work in progress. And the more we lay on the altar, the more God's going to come through. Because He's out of, He says, out of our bellies flow rivers of living water. And when you, when you read up, what that rivers mean in Greek, it means torrents. It means like something coming down through it. Like I I'm, I'm envision Niagara Falls, where there's like a torrent coming down through it. That's what he releases out of us as we continue to open ourselves up to him. And what happens when there's a log jam or something in the way, and there's a torrent of water coming? It'll make a way through it. It'll go around it or something. And that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. When we submit to the Holy Spirit, it's going to make a way through the situation, and it's going to keep flowing. But we have to come into that, that torrent, that, that river of living water that, that comes out of us. And it comes out of us again through communion, through the heart of the Father, through, through the joy of, of serving Him, through, through the pain that comes with it, through all the things. It, it comes out of the heart of the Father. You know, every one of us is waking up with a new assignment in life. Every day, we are called to a new assignment. What, or how are we looking at that new assignment? What are we doing with it? What are we doing with the assignment God has given us? This week I had the privilege to listen to a, to a teacher share some of his personal story. And he was sharing how he had a son. And the son just was not fulfilled. He was playing ball and he said the guy could not catch a ball right-handed. He could not catch a ball left-handed. It was his own son. He could not hit right-handed, and he could not hit left-handed. If you put a right-hand glove on him, the ball hit him in his face. If you put a left-hand glove on him, the ball hit him in his face. 
And he went to bat right-handed, and he would go 0 for 20. And so he got him to bat left-handed, he would go 0 for 20. Striking every time, out every time, but he said the last time he actually hit the ball. And he said he was so happy, he was jogging down toward first, and he was so happy that he hit the ball. He was out by 40 feet, but at least he hit the ball. And he played that way in golf. He just swung the ball and the bat and the water, ball went in the water, and he didn't care if he laughed. And he was just having fun. And everything he did, he came in way last. He barely hit anything. And said, last of all, he, uh, they were playing this pretty big game. And, of course, he was way behind. And it gave time to get lunches. And, then, and this one guy mentioned that this boy can go get lunches. He's a good for nothing, whatever. He didn't say all the words. But this irritated his dad. He said, you're talking about that way to my son. Something's got to change here. So he went over to his son and said, look. We're going to win this game. We're going to do this. Let's do it. I'm going to show you how to hit. We're going to hit this game. We're going to win this game. And he said, you take this club and you hit it down that hole. You focus on that hole. You hit that hole. And so he hits the ball. And the second time, he hits it in. He said, okay, good job. We're going to do the next one. And he told him how he's going to hit the ball over the, the water. And he's going to hit it over there. And he went and swung the ball. And the ball went over there. And caromed off of a wall and trickled over about six inches from the hole. He's like, yeah, we're going to do this. And he said, no, hit it in here. And he was, you know, doing his thing down through, came to the last hole. He was, by that time, he was up in second place. And there was one person in front of him. And there's a guy in front of him telling his son, don't hit the water. Don't hit the water. Don't hit the water. And the guy's like, you never do that. You don't tell them where not to hit. So they go and swing and go, where does the ball go? Water. In the water. And he tells his son, we're not going to hit the water. We're going to hit the green. Hit the green over there. And he's like, swing that thing, hit that green. And the guy swings and hits the green. About five feet from the hole. He says, knock up these things. It's downhill. Hit that, hit that hole. Five feet. We're going to hit that hole. He swings the ball and it goes in the hole. And he goes, yeah, we won it. And everybody's like, what has happened here? The guy couldn't play for nothing. And he says, we got to get an attitude to win here. We're not just going to have an attitude to fun. We're going to win. And he said, he told us this other man, he says, how was the lunch? <laughs> because that had sort of triggered him off, you know, earlier. And he said, this boy went on to lose 80 pounds. He was like a big 180 pound, 14 year old or whatever. He let him lose 80 pounds. And he went on to win 21 straight championships. Because of his attitude to win. And he said, all of a sudden, after he started hitting holes, he started carrying himself with a swagger. And when he was like, I can do this, I can do this. And how many of us, when we go through life, do we just go through life for fun, and we're okay with whatever happens? Or how many of us are actually go through life to win? And maybe it's not all about winning, but maybe it is. Maybe we can have fun in winning. How many of us actually want to see the whole county revived? Or do we say, you know what, I'm just going to have It's their problem. I'm here and do my own thing. And I want to challenge each one of us. There's something in that, I believe, that he shared that broke my heart. And the way to work, I just wept. I was like, what was that? There was some passion inside of him that, that he was like, we're going to do this. We're going to make it through this thing. We're going we're gonna to be what God called us to be, basically. And then another thing he brought out, he was saying how, how he used to read people. And when he was young, his dad would come home drunk. Half the time he was drunk and half the time he was not. And he would come in the door and he said, by the how the key went into the lock. He couldn't know if his dad was going to be an angry God, an angry dad that he has to run and protect the people from, or if he's going to be a dad that's, that is expecting them all to run to him. And he said he got to know him. And you know what? This was the kind of life he was living over growing up. And but in, in the end, he showed pictures of his dad. His dad became free from alcohol, and he was, he was on his deathbed. He was calling people out. He was giving these people that he'd been mentoring, he was calling them up. And he was telling them to be sober one more day. He said, one more day you can make it through this. One more day you can stay sober. And he was challenging all of us to be thankful one more day. And I want to challenge all of us, you know, as we go through this life, do we, do we take life for granted? Someday, we're not going to have what we have today. There's people in this house that have lost their parents or their, their dad, right? 
One day it was this way, one day it was that way. And today I want to challenge all of us that today we will choose to be thankful. Today we will choose to make a difference for Jesus Christ. Today we will choose to honor people in the workplace and, and to be a blessing to others. Because there's something that God wants from our lives. There's something he wants from this community. And we need to choose to walk in that thankfulness. We need to choose to walk in that peace. We need to choose to walk in that love. And we need to choose to walk in that respect. Because we don't know when we have another day. We don't know when is the last time that we'll be able to see our parents. We don't know what the last words are that we're going to be saying to our wife. Maybe when you fall asleep, you'll never even be able to say another word to her. You don't know. But may that heart of love come out of us. That we will take this day. And we will use it to honor and glorify Him. Jesus Christ. May the words of life come out of our hearts today. When we continue to, to walk. One more thank you note. You know, he shared a story of a guy that was at the Home Depot 10 years ago, so it was tanking, it was failing. And they put a new person in charge. And this person started writing thank you notes, 100 a week, handwritten thank you notes to his employees. And they realized that the whole thing changed. A heart of thankfulness came out of them. A heart of thankfulness came into the employees. A heart of thankfulness came through the, from, through the whole staff. And it is that way with us. We need to have this heart of thankfulness. Thankful for what people did. You know, every one of us has somebody that did, that spoke into their life that allowed you to become who you are. You know, I want to honor my Uncle John here. He was the one that gave me a platform that I could have a business. He created a, a place. Yeah, he didn't teach everything, but he created a place that I could learn, the, that I could learn the trade, that I could go and become successful in what I did. And every one of us, we can look around, there's every one of us has somebody in their life that has spoken into your life. Our parents have brought us to a certain place. People around us have brought us to a certain place. There's nobody that will go all the way with the Lord without somebody that is going to speak and give them direction. And we need to honor those people. We need to respect them. We need to bless them. And we need to be thankful. You know, behind every... I know the, the, the saying I heard this morning, that behind every dangerous man, there's a praying wife. No, no, not everyone is married here. And you can be dangerous without that. But there's something when two people come together and they press in for something, there's something that shifts in the heavenlies that is powerful. And every one of your wife, women here, you standing with her where your husband is not an accident. And it is empowering them to go places that you have no idea. Together, we're going to make a difference. Together we're going to, you know, we want to be known by what we, another message that came forward was, what do people see when they look at us? Do they know what you're against? Or do they know what you're for? May we walk from this place knowing that the people looking at us know what we're for. Not everything we're against, but what are we for? What are we on this earth for? What are we going to make a difference for? Where are we going and how are we going to get there? And we're going to keep pressing forward through the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Because God has anointed you. He has appointed you. And He has approved of you. He has made you the way you are. And He has brought us together. And you are an unstoppable force. You have got what it takes to finish strong. You have the Spirit of Christ inside of you. You have the hunger of God inside of you. And I'm going to, I, I want to just stir that up inside of you. That you will go from this place. And you will decide that you're going to win. And every situation that you're walking, going to come into, there's going to be lost people coming to Christ. Because you want to see them come to Christ. There's a hunger that I want to release. I release the hunger inside of you to be all that God has made you to be. And to have fun and glory in it. Because that's where it's fun. Yeah, it's fun playing ball and losing. But it's more fun playing ball and winning. It's more fun when you, when you can actually be the... And that's something that God put in there. God has called us to be champions. God has called us to run the race well. And to finish strong. And I encourage you, finish strong. God is for you. God is with you. And then pain and situations come up. Just release it. Just release it to the Lord and know that God has allowed it to happen because you have chosen to lay yourself on the altar again. And may we continue that cycle of self-sacrifice and prayer and pain and joy as we continue to be cleansed in the name of Jesus.